Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeff Hoy. Uh, first of all, I would like to welcome you uh, to today's seminar with Anna Longo. Um, it, is, um, it is the fifth seminar um, of um, our series, Dialogues on Philosophy and Technology. Um, you can find on our web on the website uh, the previous programs with uh, Katharine Malabu, uh, Kami Cham, uh, Jean-Louis Barthélemy and uh, Susanna Lim Limbeck. So it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, Anna today. So I'm going to give a short introduction uh, about Anna and then I'll give the stage to Anna. And after the, uh, the, the talk from Anna, we are going to have a discussion. Um, so Anna is a philosopher and she's directing the program Technology of Time at the Collège International de Philosophie in Paris. And he, she has been teaching at the University uh, at Paris One and the California Institutes of the Arts. Um, she has been invited to keynote speakers um, as keynote speaker in conferences all over the world and has been contributing to peer reviewed journals and international anthologies. Uh, and I should mention that her forthcoming book titled The, the Game of Induction, Automatic Knowledge, Production and Philosophical Reflection, uh, which, which will firstly appear in French, I believe in, in March, um, we explore the progressive affirmation of the game, uh, theoretic conception of knowing that constitutes the paradigm for algorithmic learning and contemporary AI. At the same time, it proposes to consider aesthetics as a form of knowledge that cannot be reduced to the former and that oper operates within its own horizon of truth. And today she's going to give a talk also on AI, on the uh, pre um, predictive AI and uh, on the question of prophecy. And I must also say that Anna is, uh, is one of the really rare philosophers who I know are really working hard on, on, on science, on mathematics, and on philosophy and aesthetics. So um, again, thank you very much, Anna, for agreeing to, to participate in this seminar and having the dialogue. So now I will give the stage to you. And uh, afterwards, we, we are going to have a dialogue. Thank you very much, Yuk, for this, this invitation and for this opportunity of discussing together. So it really means a lot for me. Um, OK, so I, I'm going to, to start this uh, presentation uh, about uh, predictive technology and prophetic uh, techne which is really based on uh, the question concerning technology uh, by, um, by Heidegger. Um, so in the question concerning technology, um, Heidegger warns uh, about the extreme danger that is represented by the progressive unfolding of the mode of revealing that for him characterizes the essence of technology. So he claims that the essence of technology is enframing, and uh, he defines enframing as a specific way of knowing natural system through challenging and provocation. So as we read in the question concerning technology, I quote, uh, such challenging happens in that the energy concealed in nature is unlocked. What is unlocked is transformed. What is transformed is stored up. What is stored up is in turn distributed, and what is distributed is switched about ever anew, unlocking, transforming, storing, distributing, and switching about our ways of revealing. But the revealing never simply comes to an end." End of quote. As a consequence, beings are correctly or objectively known when they can be efficiently employed as productive resources. This entails that to know means to select the best strategies to produce the expected responses or reactions. As Heidegger notes, uh, modern physics hypotheses are no more about the eternal laws of nature, but they are about the results of the interaction between experimental devices 
and natural systems. So I quote, uh, modern science way of representing uh, pulses and entraps nature as a calculable current of forces. Modern physics is not experimental physics because it applies apparatus to the questioning of nature. The reverse is true because physics indeed already as pure theory sets nature up to exhibit itself as a current of forces calculable in advance. It orders its experiments precisely for the purpose of asking whether and how natural reports itself when set up in this way, end of quote. So according to this um, mode of unveiling, which is the essence of technology, uh, to know means to select the practices that allow for producing the desired results um, or um, to, to transform resources uh, in something that can be um, used to produce further resources of, or goods. So at the first level, uh, the danger of enframing, um, which is the technological mode of revealing, is that it causes humans to a blind consumption of beings. Um, in fact, what is considered to be uh, true are hypotheses that are efficient with respect to the end of assuring infinite technical productivity. Uh, however, more importantly, the danger that Heidegger and Leitz is that by pursuing this path of unveiling, uh, human re humans risk to be turned into resources, into resources like any other physical system. So humans risk to be reduced to an object like any other object, which is a resource. So as Heidegger explains, I quote, only to the extent that man for his part is already challenged to exploit the energies of nature, can this revealing that orders happen. If man is challenged order to do this, then does not man itself belong even more originally than nature within the standing reserve? The current talk about human resources gives evidences of this." End of quote. So according to Heidegger, uh, humans can be considered as resources since they are not only workers but participate into the productive process, but also because they are consumers that motivate technical productivity uh, through consumption. However, according to Heidegger, uh, humans cannot be completely identified with resources uh, since uh, um, why natural beings are the objects of revealing, uh, humans are the subjects of revealing. So they produce the knowledge of beings and so they cannot be reduced to mere objects of knowledge. Um, as Heidegger claims, I quote, yet precisely because man is challenged more originally than are the energies of nature, so challenge into the process of ordering, he never he can be transformed into a mere standing reserve. Since man drives technology forward, he takes part in ordering as a way of revealing, end of quote. So according to Heidegger, humans are not completely transparent to revealing because the activity or revealing itself cannot be re revealed by the same activity of revealing. So humans cannot be revealed to be mere resources in the same way as other beings are objectively known as resources. So since humans are the subjects of revealing, their essence, according to Heidegger, exceeds the way in which systems are scientifically accounted for. So if it is true then that under the unfolding of the technological mode of revealing, you must behave mechanically uh, as any other system that is provoked to produce the desired output when provided with the appropriate input. Uh, for Heidegger, humans differ from scientifically known system because they are supposed to think and to know in a more original sense. So accordingly, 
uh, the supreme danger that Heidegger and Leitz consists in the exclusion of this more essential way of thinking that characterizes humans, uh, or what in other texts uh, Heidegger calls the transcendence of Dasein. So for Heidegger, humans are historically destined to take part into a mode of unveiling. However, they cannot be unveiled according to this paradigm of knowing, since the very act of committing to unveiling cannot be scientifically taken, taken into account. So only metaphysical questioning can access the very essence of man as whom is called by a destiny that orient his activity of knowing without defining his essence. So as a consequence, humans are essentially free. Uh, they cannot be completely determined by a specific mo mode of unveiling. So they cannot be known according to a specific mode of unveiling. And they do not have to commit unconditionally to a given mode of unveiling. So as Edegger states, I quote, the freedom of the free consists neither in unfettered arbitrariness nor in the constraint of mere laws. Freedom is that which conceals in a way that opens to light, in whose clearing shimmers the veil that hides the essential occurrence of all truth and lets the veil appear as what veils. Freedom is the realm of a dis destiny that at any given time starts a revealing on its way." End of quote. So according to Heidegger, the real danger represented by, technolo by technological mode of unveiling is that the concealment is the concealment of this essential truth about humans. So the concealment of a essential freedom. So the real danger consists in the suppression of a reflective capacity for accessing the truth of being beyond what ought to be considered as scientifically true about beings. This truth is that any mode of unveiling is always concealment and that no system of unveiling can be considered as stating the absolute truth about being. Uh, as Heidegger explains, I quote, but in framing does not simply endanger man in his relationship to himself and to everything that is. As a destiny, it banishes man into the kind of revealing that is an ordering. Where this ordering all sway, it drives out every other possibility of revealing. Above all, in framing conceals that revealing, which in the sense of poesis, Let's what presence come forth into appearance. End of quote. So I'm going to deal later with what Adegas calls uh, poiesis. And for the moment, I would like to stress that the danger of the technological mode of revealing consists then in its absolutization. This means not only that any other way of revealing might be blocked, but more profoundly that the very kind of philosophical inquiry that expresses human freedom might disappear from the horizon. The risk is that by unconditionally committing to the technical mode of revealing, humans might finally recognize scientific logic as the procedure for producing any possible truth and that they might stop looking for a more primal truth. So it is precisely because humans actually gave up metaphysical questioning that they can be completely identified with resources, in particular to resources of information as it is presently the case. So to this respect, it's important to note that Heidegger had the intuition uh, that information was the key for technological uh, development. Um, so I quote, uh, physics in its retreat from the kind of representation that turns only to objects, which has been the sole standard until recently, will never be able to renounce this one thing, that nature reports itself in some way or other that is identifiable through calculation and that it remains orderable as a system of information." End of quote. 
So to be mathematically ordered within the unfolding of a technological mode of revealing, physical systems are considered as patterns of information that can be used to produce further information in a sort of process of technological compl complexification of a procedure for calculation. While the order of information is measured with respect to the efficacy toward an end, so uh, order information is the information which is efficient with respect to the obtention of uh, a goal, any system can be ordered as a machine more or less efficient from the point of view of computing. As a consequence, technical progress is an advancement of the power of producing order information. Uh, so more developed the system are um, more efficient in uh, producing um, a goal. So they represent more ordered patterns of information. Um, but the technical progress is also the production of systems or machines that can be identified with more complex pattern of information. So technological progress consists in the introduction of more efficient rules for organizing reality toward the end of productivity. It is then the advent of artificial intelligence that Heidegger couldn't see. Uh, so this advent of artificial intelligence can be considered as the final unfolding of a technical mode of revealing. Humans are finally known as patterns of information, the efficacy of which is technologically optimized. Uh, in fact, uh, artificial intelligence is the technology uh, that is suitable for predicting human decisions and to orient them by providing adapted inputs in the same way as any other natural system is objectively known as a computational procedure that produces an output given some input. At the same time, artificial intelligence is the updated version of the computational procedure that allowed humans to develop previous technology by pursuing scientific inquiry. Hence, from the perspective of artificial intelligence, humans are objectively and successfully known as computational systems that do not differ from any other physical system. So they are just more complex. And uh, so like any other physical system, humans can be exploited as resources for information. So we could say that uh, artificial intelligence is the result of the scientific assessment of the activity of revealing. So I said that revealing cannot be scientifically known, but artificial intelligence is the result of a scientific knowledge of the activity of revealing. So it's scientific knowledge of the activity of knowing. Uh, so it's a sort of revealing of revealing as a cognitive procedure. And this of course contradicts Heidegger claimed that the subject of revealing cannot be reduced to an object of revealing. So the information that is extracted from humans is functional to further technological advance, and technological advance corresponds to the development of increasingly efficient productive strategies or to the introduction of new algorithmic rules for organizing reality more efficiently. So the fact that human decisions can be predicted by artificial intelligence means that human reasoning is actually conformed to a recursive learning algorithm that is the referent of artificial intelligence uh, predictive hypothesis. So artificial intelligence can predict human decisions because suppose that human's decision depends upon an algorithmic um, rule for, for learning. Um, so this learning algorithm uh, is what it objectively defines humans as thinkers. So it is the scientific hypothesis about the recursive procedure that identify humans objectively as rational learners that allows for programming machines that optimize the cognitive procedure in the same way as uh, a machine is the optimization of the algorithmic procedure that is responsible for the functioning or for the behavior of physical and biological systems. So the development of 
uh, artificial intelligence is when the realization of what Heidegger saw as the possible future risk. Not only humans are actually objectively and truly known as resources for information like any other system, but the activity of thinking is finally objectively known and assessed as computational learning. So that human reasoning can be computationally simulated as an algorithmic procedure for evolving efficient strategies means that there is nothing more than this to be known about thought and then and that thinking can be truly assessed as a very complex algorithmic procedure for automatically improving knowledge. This, of course, seriously uh, challenges Heidegger's assumption that thinking as revealing exceeds the rational procedure for producing logically true knowledge or for producing efficient behavior as an ordered sequence of information. So as a consequence, the metaphysical inquiry on revealing appears to be completely meaningless or based on a non-scientifically valid conception of knowing. So from a scientific standpoint, in fact, the cognitive procedure that allows for the evolution of knowledge can be objectively known. So revealing can be revealed in the same way as any other recursive procedure that determine the adaptation of organic beings can be objectively determined. When all we can think can be thought by artificial intelligence, when all our decisions can be predicted as, predicted as consequences of an objectively knowable rule for updating belief, can we still believe that we can access a more original truth that could save us from becoming part of a global machine for information production, consumption, and reproduction? Can we still believe that we are more than objectively knowable computational machine for statistic learning? As a consequence, it would seem that the risk Heidegger anticipated as a future possibility is our present reality. But revealing has been explained in logic terms as a cognitive computational procedure for evolving knowledge and practices, not only allows for the reduction of humans to efficiently exploitable patterns of information, but it has also provoked the exclusion of what Heidegger considered as the very philosophical questioning. The exclusion of this questioning marks the impossibility of the Heideggerian prophecy for salvation. So to find a solution to, to this problem and to show that the Heideggerian prophetic announcement for salvation is still an option, I think that it is important to take into account uh, Baumgarten's uh, aesthetics. But before uh, this, it is important to introduce the role of artistic practice in um, Heidegger by stressing that for him, it's the result of genuine metaphysical questioning. So according to Heidegger, the philosopher and the artist are engaged in a similar way of interrogating being. So as we know, Heidegger proposes that the antidote against the risk uh, was coming from what he calls poiesis, and that identifies uh, with uh, artistic technique. Uh, so according to Heidegger, uh, poiesis is a mode of bringing forth that let beings to appear in their truth, a truth that does not correspond to their logic or scientific truth, and that is more original than the latter. So the poetic activity of revealing is what is excluded as a legitimate way of knowing under the domination of a logic norm for truth. As Heidegger explains, I quote, um, but then framing does not simply endanger man in his relationship to himself and to everything that is. As a destiny, it banishes man from the kind of revealing that is an ordering. Where this ordering also way drives out every other possibility of revealing and above all, in framing conceal that revealing which, in the sense of poiesis, let what presence come forth into appearance. So while End of quote. So while in framing is a mode of revealing that conceal revealing as such, poiesis is a mode of revealing that reveals revealing, but does not hide that being is essentially what is old out of nothing within the transcendence of Dasein. 
As Heidegger explains in um, the conference, uh, which is called What is Metaphysics? Um, I quote, Dasein means being held out into the nothing, holding itself out into the nothing. Dasein is in each case already beyond beings as a wall. This being beyond beings we call transcendence. If in the ground of its essence, Dasein were not transcending, which now means if it were not in advance holding itself out into the nothing, then it could never be related to beings nor even to itself. Without the original revelation of this nothing, no selfhood, no freedom." End of quote. Accordingly, um, poiesis is connected to the primal metaphysical activity through which thought commits to let something coming into being, to let being to manifest as something rather than the identical with nothing. Like philosophy, uh, poiesis is an activity of revealing, but reveals revealing. So art is essentially appearance of truth, of the truth of being, but acknowledges its products as mere appearances appearances of a deeper but not fully graspable truth. As Nietzsche said, art is a lie that is worth more than truth, and truth here is logical truth. While science has the ambition of revealing the absolute truth of beings, uh, on the contrary, poesis truly reveals beings as contingent appearances of a truth of being, a truth that cannot be grasped without hiding it beyond the revealing veil of appearance. So the truth of being is at the same time revealed and hidden by the appearance of beings. However, in the same way as artificial intelligence represents for philosophical um, inquiry um, a, a danger, it also seems to prevent the possibility of poiesis. Not only because the access to a non-logical determination of thinking is denied as illusory, as an illusion. Um, as we said, thinking can be objectively assessed as an algorithmic procedure for evolving knowledge. Uh, but also uh, because contemporary artificial intelligence seems to be very creative. It can produce artworks and at the same time, it can correctly guess or uh, our taste and they can predict what we aesthetically judge as beautiful. However, it is important to note that artificial intelligence applies a logic account of artistic production by considering artistic images as patterns of information. Accordingly, different styles are like, are like general concepts that identify structural relations. Um, and similarly, the series of the works of a painter can be algorithmically produced um, by, a vari by variating uh, the value of correlated variables that identify the pattern of information that can be induced or abstracted by observing existing works. So for example, we have algorithm that can produce all the paintings that Van Gogh did not paint. And this is possible because they analyze the series of existing work and, and they produce, they guess, uh, this is an hypothesis about the algorithm that can produce the whole series. Um, and the series, uh, this algorithm is identified with a pattern of stable relations that is observed in all the existing paintings. Uh, hence, uh, the question is, is poiesis as an activity that is supposed to save us from the domination of the logic of technological unveiling still an option? When all the artworks we can produce can be produced by artificial intelligence, and when artists can be objectively known as algorithmic procedure for generating recognizable series of images, can we still believe, as Heidegger does, but the poetic mode of thinking constitutes a challenge for the technological mode of unveiling. Moreover, when our appreciation for artwork, that is what is usually identified with aesthetic judgment, can be predicted by artificial intelligence, can we still think that aesthetics constitute a non-logic approach to knowledge? Um, Baumgarten aesthetics, 
which I think lies in the background of Heidegger reflections on poesies via uh, Nietzsche. Uh, so Baumgarten Aesthetics provides us with an answer to this question. Uh, so in particular, it, it shows, I think, uh, why we cannot reduce aesthetic knowledge to logic knowledge and why the truth that is produced by artistic practices is a sort of truth that cannot be assessed by logic. So Alexander Baumgarten uh, is the philosopher who first introduced the term aesthetics in the 18th century uh, for indicating the sensible faculty of knowing uh, that for him is distinct from the rational or logical faculty of knowing. So there are two different faculties. Um, so they produce two different kinds of knowledge. What is, in, is interesting in this distinction is that aesthetic knowledge and logic knowledge are different methodologies or different techniques for producing true discourses. These different discourses are meant to communicate and make evident to distinct kinds of truth. Logic aims uh, to state the objective and universally valid relation among general abstract concepts whereas aesthetics aims to inquire on the most determined and singular truth. Rational knowledge proceeds by eliminating from the particular all the qualities that prevent us from grasping the stable relations that identify it with the elements of a class of equivalent things. On the contrary, aesthetic knowledge takes into account all the traits that are not pertinent for obtaining a mathematical account of a being. The sensible richness of real particulars that overwhelms the power of concepts. In Leibnizian terms, and Baumgarten is a Leibnizian, we can say that logic aims uh, to the more general truth, uh, the truth that applies to the largest possible set of entities, Whereas aesthetic looks for the metaphysical truth that identify any possible existing entity in the God's mind. Uh, so it's a very singular truth. So God knows any being, any possibly existent being as a unique being. Um, so this truth includes for any singular and possible existing beings, all the qualities and the accidents that makes of it something unique something that is not actually equivalent to the member of the logic classes to which it belongs. So any individual from the aesthetic point of view is different from any other. Uh, so it exceeds the power of the concept. Uh, so it, it's not equivalent to all the other elements that uh, compose the same classes. Um, accordingly, uh, as knowledge of a singular rather than of a general, Aesthetic knowledge points to a truth that is different but complementary with respect to the truth of logic. So the distinction of the two procedures for knowing is important because it does not exclude that artworks might be logically determined as general patterns of information and that technical or mathematical product can be also aesthetically judged as beautiful. So it goes in the two, in the two ways. Uh, since there are two kinds of knowledge to, to modes of knowing, aesthetic and, and logic. We, are, we can logically know artistic production, but we can also aesthetically know a logic production. So this is the reason why we say, for example, that a mathematical theorem is beautiful. It's not logically beautiful, it's aesthetically beautiful. But since we have two modes of, of knowing, we can appreciate aesthetically logical construction, but we can also um determine logically artistic production but the fact that we address logically artistic production does not exclude uh, that there is a proper aesthetic knowledge uh, so algorithms know artworks according to general algorithmic rules that can generate the whole series of elements belonging to the class of a style but this does not mean that they are knowing artworks aesthetically uh, which means by grasping all the traits that makes of an artwork a singular and unique production. 
So the knowledge of the singular simply, simply lies outside the possibility of science. To know an artwork logically, in fact, means to abstract, to make abstraction of all the information that is in excess with respect to the goal of recognizing the pattern of stable relations that allows to generate the series of the elements of a class. So in other words, uh, to logically know an artwork means to select the informative elements whose that are essential to classify the piece in a general class of equivalent products. Um, all the other information is considered as aleatory or non-informative and can be produced by a random generator. On the contrary, from the perspective of aesthetic knowledge, what counts is exactly all this aleatory information, all the infinite um, set of traits that make of a work a singular entity that cannot be said to be equivalent to any other. Accordingly, the algorithmic account of art does not challenge aesthetic knowledge, since the letter aims to a truth, the truth of a singular that cannot be grasped by the former. So now uh, for Baumgarten, aesthetic knowledge is not collected in scientific treaties, but in poetry, literature, and it's manifest in artworks. Uh, in his aesthetics, which is the, the book he wrote, um, Baumgarten aims to clarify the technique for bringing forth aesthetic truths, a technique that humans master long before mastering mathematics and logic to produce reliable scientific knowledge. So it's a more ancient uh, knowledge, a more ancient technique. This poetic technique consists in procedures for thinking beautifully or to produce images of possibly existing beings by bringing to clarity the obscure chaos of the infinite sensible perception that constitute the truth of a singular entity. For example, the character of a novel is constructed as a singular individual that appears to the reader as someone that could really exist in some world, someone who is imagined as an infinite wall of distinctive characters that exceeds the possibility of classifying him under the logical concept of a category of decision maker. So in order to let this rich and clear image, um, which is composed by an infinity of small obscure perception, to let this image to emerge in the reader's mind, uh, the writer has to master the technique or to possess what Baumgarten identify with the skills of the aesthetician. So by selecting very determined and small details about the characters, so for example, by telling the specific accident or ways of appearing or by describing ephemeral a contingent manifestation, the writer let the reader to create the image of someone unique in his own mind. So all the information that the writer selects to give form to his character is exactly the information that is useless to know someone as the element belonging to a logical category. So the aesthetician is focused on contingent traits, on the aleatory information that allows to think of something as something unique. And it is by enlightening very small and determined details but the aesthetician is able to construct a description that is suitable for letting emerge not only the whole image of the unique characters, but also the unique world that surrounds him. So the most uh, complete description of the smallest detail, in fact, allows to perceive obscurely the totality of the reality within which the existence of this unique being is possible. So by grasping a very small, small truth and, and to describe this very small truth, which usually is just uh, ephemeral appearance. Uh, so by describing very precisely, very deeply this, this appearance until his metaphysical truth, it's possible to enlighten uh, all the world in which this existence is, is possible, but in an obscure way. So the, the clarification of, of our details allows to produce an obscure image of all the world which is surrounding it. Accordingly, by grasping a very determined metaphysical truth, the complete material determination of a detail 
what is engendered by the statistician is the whole world that is compatible with this existence. So the inquiry on the essence of an individual being allows them to bring forth the whole world to which it belongs and to see it as, uni as a unique entity, as a destiny that can be assessed by exploring the infinite richness of the smallest detail. So I think that this is the reason why the essence of technology, which is the grasping of a destiny of revealing, is said by Heidegger to emerge within a poetic interrogation of truth that cannot be access, assess, accessed by logic. Uh, this, this means that to, to, to grasp the world as the world of a technological destiny means um, to have the experience to, to produce the image of the totality of the world that cannot be logically grasped because we, we are always inside this world when we are logically exploring this. But in order to produce the obscure image of the essence of this unique world, we need a poetic approach. So the essence of technology can actually be grasped only by this aesthetic um, envisioning of, um, of the world. So the, the essence of technology is an aesthetic truth in some way. Uh, moreover, it is important to stress that according to Baumgarten, uh, the aesthetic, the technique of, of aesthetics is supposed to produce true fictions. Since the infinite totality of the traits that characterize a singular being cannot be thought uh, of, so it's an infinity of traits, so they cannot uh, be um, they, they cannot be understood. Our our mind cannot um, contain all of them. Uh, so the aim is to let clear but not distinct um, the image. Uh, that stands for this truth. So it's a, a way of letting this unknowable of obscurity to be partially enlightened through the detail that is extracted or brought forth as something determined. This entails that in order to let this appearance to emerge, the poet or the artist can include traits or qualities that we never experience in our empirical reality. So for example, to let uh, the quality of a character or of a word, our word to emerge, the poet can narrate a sequence of facts that cannot possibly happen in our world. However, the fiction that emerge can surprisingly enlighten an aspect of our reality that we wouldn't have never been able to grasp otherwise. So this detail let us to see our reality as a destiny as a unique and singular unfolding. It allows us to look into the essence of our world through the veil of an ephemeral and unique appearance. The bringing forth of this veil is the construction of a fiction that unveils a deeper truth, um, but lets it to be obscurely uh, perceived. So without going deeper into uh, Baumgarten's aesthetics, uh, I just would like to suggest that, like uh, in the Heideggerian conception of poesis, aesthetic is a technique for pursuing and conveying a more original truth compared to the truth of logic. This essential truth concerns the secret essence of beings, and it is related to a question, to a question uh, about the indeterminable chaos of sensible qualities from which something has to be held out into a determined appearance, into a beautiful form. In both the thinkers, Heidegger and Baumgarten, uh, poesy uh, achieves this, this goal of letting something to appear out of nothing, for Baumgarten out of the chaos of the sensible, um, and this appearance is a true fiction that can be constructed only by using language in a way that challenges the rules of logic. So we can now go back to um, Heidegger poesies uh, to see why we can still believe in the prophecy of poetic salvation. Uh, so according to Heidegger, poesies is the technique that by revealing, revealing as such, also reveals the contingent or fictional character of all the construction that we usually take for 
necessary and absolute truth. So this is the saving power of art according to Heidegger. It reveals that the reality constructed according to the norm of logic under the domination of a technological mode of un un unveiling is just an appearance of truth, an appearance that can be revealed to be a mere appearance only by pursuing the metaphysical inquiry into the essence of being. It is this, in this inquiry that, according to Heidegger, characterizes thought essentially. It is within this inquiry that thinking can be understood as the original and free opening up of a space for being, of a space for the finite and contingent appearance of truth in which any reality consists. Um, it is this interrogation about becoming into being of a world that could have not existed, that allows thought to repeat its own beginning and renew its commitment to uh, truth. As Heidegger explains in what is metaphysics, I quote, only the, if science exists on the basis of metaphysics can it advance further in its essential task, task, which is not to amass and classify bits of knowledge, but to disclose in ever renewed fashion the entire region of truth in nature and history. Only because the nothing is manifest in the ground of Dasein can the total strangeness of being overwhelm us. Only when the strangeness of being oppresses us does it arouse and evoke wonder. Only on the ground of wonder, the revelation of the nothing, does the why loom before us. Only because the why is possible as such, can we in a def definite way inquire into grounds and ground them. Only because we can inquire and ground is the destiny of our existence placed in the hands of a researcher. The question of the nothing puts us, the questioners, in question, end of quote. So poiesis is a technique that allows us for constructing true lies, for producing appearances that let us grasp obscurely the inaccessible truth of being, but for Heidegger is identical with nothing. Uh, so artworks are then appearances or veils that on the one hand bring forth true appearances of truth and on the other hand do not dissimulate their own fictional character. On the contrary, the products of technology hide or dissimulate their own uh, fictionality or contingency because scientific truth imposes itself as the absolute grasping of the truth of being. So it seems to me that if contemporary technology is predictive, uh, poesy or techne can be said to be prophetic. So contemporary artificial intelligence is based on, probabilis on a probabilistic account of knowledge, and the goal is to anticipate the behavior of different kinds of beings in such a way to make the decision that is more suitable for obtaining the desired result. Um, accordingly, knowledge is an ongoing learning process that is ruled by inductive method. The result of past interactions are functional to update the hypothesis about the outcomes of future interaction in such a way that to progressively select the more adapted strategies. This leads to an historical evolutive process within which organizations are modified and behaviors tends to be developed toward increasing efficiency. On the contrary, poiesis is a technique for bringing forth appearances, clear but at the same time not completely distinct images or visions uh, that depends upon the mysterious speculative capacity of getting beyond objectively known beings for grasping their essence or being, or their aesthetic truth. Prophecies, in fact, are not rational scientific prediction based on acceptable evidences, but they are dreamy visions of destiny. Such visions are obtaining, obtained by suspending the traditional and normative conception of beings in order to grasp beings as the apparent effects of the mysterious forces of destiny that hold and shape the world as an ordered process, a process that can be scientifically known. But these forces as the reason why the world can be scientifically known. Um, moreover, prophecies are traditionally inverse. So like poems, 
inverse like poems, and they are the products of techniques for conveying through visions, through a poetic use of language, a use of language that does not respect the formal rules of logic, and that do not state any logically acceptable uh, truths. And um, Baumgarten, in fact, considered that uh, prophecy is uh, is part of aesthetics. So you make a list of all the disciplines that, that are aesthetic disciplines or, or that are can be considered uh, aesthetic knowledge. And the art of prophecy is among um, the aesthetics uh, way of knowing. So the prophet, like the Heideggerian philosopher or poet, invents the words for letting truth to be summoned into appearances. As reading the notes that Heidegger added to the published version of the conference, what is metaphysics, I quote, um, obedient to the voice of being, thinking looks to it for those words which the truth of being finds becoming in language. Only when the language of historical man is put into words as it reached its own proper death. But it has found its death, um, then it's given a sign of the guarantee of a silent voice of a hidden source. The thinking of being minds words and fulfill its destiny in such watchfulness. So the idea is that uh, the, the poet create uh, the language uh, which is adapted to convey uh, a truth um, that did, didn't exist before. So poiesis is a peculiar technique that allows for providing with sensible appearance the obscurely grasped truth of being. It is a technique that does not reveal what can be rationally expected to happen in the future given the present condition, but it's an art that reveals reality as the unfolding of a destiny we are usually blind to. In fact, in our ordinary reality, we are convinced to make free decisions to obtain freely determined goods. And so we do not see that we are locked into a game that, even though it produces an unpredictable infinite series of novelties, is in itself the unfolding of one destiny, of a mode of unveiling that prevents us from accessing and expressing our more essential freedom, the freedom of inquiring on the reason for serving a mode of unveiling that force to consume anything as a productive resource and that reduce ourselves to the executor of a logic that is taken as the necessary rule for thinking. So we are in a certain way um, serving a mode of unveiling, even though we think that we are free within this mode of unveiling, actually we are locked into this mode of unveiling. So we cannot, we are blind uh, with respect to our freedom, which is the freedom of unveiling, uh, unveiling, or, or to let being to, to appear um, in different ways. Hence, that technology can be said to be the unfolding of a, our dangerous destiny, as Heidegger claims, is a prophecy. A prophecy that depends upon the obscure aesthetic grasping of the essence uh, of a mode of unveiling that we have unconditionally decided to serve. And so it is the absolutization of logic that prevents us from pursuing another kind of truth, the truth of a singular that is provided by aesthetic knowledge. And it's only by knowing our world as a singular unfolding that we can perceive it as a destiny and as a dangerous uh, destiny. So this prophecy reveals revealing as such, and at the same time, by warning about the risk entailed by technological revealing, it also sets the condition for salvation. It invites us to free our thinking from the servitude to logic of productive efficacy to enter a more original mode of thinking, which is the aesthetic way of knowing. It invites us to be actually uh, philosopher or poets in order to fulfill the prophecy of salvation. So it is by revealing the necessary destiny. So by revealing the necessity of a destiny, a prophecy always calls uh, to act in order to prevent this destiny. Uh, so the, the Heideggerian prophecy calls us or invites us to be philosopher and artists, 
So it invites us to be prophets. It invites us to prophesy the incalculable event of the opening up of a new space for poetically constructing another reality. The reality of a mode of unveiling that does not conceal unveiling, but does not prevent us from expressing the essential freedom of uh, thought. This is why the questioning about the essence of being, that is the condition for poetically bringing forth artworks, is the only hope for salvation. While there is no guarantee for success, since we don't have um, we do not have any causal power on destiny. It is the simple fact of trying that is a tangible sign that thinking is not dead yet, that has not been totally turned into an artificially living automaton. It is a sign that the event of the opening up of an, our, another destiny is still a possibility. So it's the, the simple fact of announcing the, pros, the prophecy of thinking that uh, fulfill the prophecy of thinking, because in order to announce this prophecy, we have to be already poets or artists. Um, so I think this is the, the self-fulfillment of the prophecy of, of salvation according to, according to Heidegger. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. So thank you, thank you very much, Anna, for this great talk um, and uh, very inspiring. But at the same time, I think we have a lot to discuss. I, I, as I told you before, I just gave three hours of lectures on Heidegger's the question concerning technology this morning. And tomorrow I have to give another three hours of lecture on the origin of the work of art. So a lot of Heidegger. Uh, but it's also a very good occasion to, um, um, because of I'm teaching, uh, Heidegger right now, so he also um, allowed me to, to engage uh, with the text and from Heidegger, but also your thought. And, um, and uh, also I find it pretty, uh, well, I'm really happy to find that what you were talking about is also quite, uh, you know, we, we have the same kind of, uh, we have an agreement. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, for example, in the book that I just published, uh, Art and Cosmos Techniques, where I, Heidegger is one of the protagonists and Heidegger's writing on art. Um, so I, 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 I like very much how you make a distinction between prediction and prophecy. I think this is a very, a very important um, distinction that you have made. Prediction based on calculation and prophecy as a way to, to as a call for the coming or for the arrival of the unknown um, uh, in, in, in the language of, of Heidegger. Uh, um, when he, for example, especially when, when, um, when he referred to uh, Arthur Hambus, um uh, letter to the volume where he make it very uh, clear that the task of a poet is to call for the arrival or to welcome the arrival of the unknown. So that's a, a, a prophecy uh, of the unknown or even maybe you can say the unknowable. So this is a very, 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 um, it's a very clear to, clear to me. Um, there are some technical questions, and maybe I will start with the first one. Um, and also, you know, uh, between Heidegger and uh, and Baugarten. So I I want to thank you also for bringing Baugarten to, to to discussion because I I think Baugarten is very important for us to revisit the question of aesthetics, and because today we talk about AI aesthetics, we talk about uh, machine learning aesthetics, we talk about metaverse aesthetics without knowing what it means by aesthetics. We as actually people, we, when, you talk, when, when people talk about that, it's only talking about certain kind of taste uh, or certain, kind of, certain forms of expression, uh, but it doesn't really touch the question of aesthetics. But now I would, it's a precisely on the question of aesthetics, I wanted to ask you, um, as we know that for Baugarten, 
aesthetics, uh, especially we refer to the 1750 aesthetica. The aesthetics is the study of, um, uh, if, we, if we refer to the first paragraph that she wrote, aesthetics is about the study of the lower faculty of cognition. So I want to emphasize here the lower faculty because the upper faculty means logic, means clear and distinct ideas. And aesthetic is not, is, is not clear and not distinct. Therefore, it is called a lower faculty. And this lower faculty um, refers to, for, for example, you, you also said that Baugarten is Leibnizian, uh, that it is, a, a, it is dedicated to studying what Leibniz called je ne sais quoi. <laughs> I don't know what it is. No. And, um, but where for Heidegger, uh, when Heidegger is talking about the po poiesis, for example, um, apparently, I, you know, apparently it is not a reference to a lower faculty of cognition. Uh, it's not, um, um, so therefore, when you, when, 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 when there is a pair, when you pair up Heidegger's uh, concept of, or, uh, of poiesis, when he tried to define the essence of techne, of the Greek techne, and Baugarten's uh, aesthetics, um, then you make, it sounds to me that you make kind of an equivalence or you kind of trying to establish a relation when you say aesthetics is a technique. Uh, so you refer to kind of a highly. So I see, I, I wanted to ask you how you make, how, if you see this, you know, difference, um, you know, philosophical, in, in philosophical speaking, but also historically speaking, um, and how, how can we square these two, you know, Heidegger's concept of poiesis and aesthetics, you know, for, for the kind of uh, je ne sais quoi uh, that Baugarten treated as a low faculty of cognition. Because I think maybe one way to think about this is through the mediation of Kant, because for Kant, when he took up Baugarten's aesthetics, uh, especially when he talked about the beautiful and, and, and so on, uh, that is no longer the question of a low faculty of cognition. I don't know if my question was, uh, was clear to you. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I, I think that um, lower faculty of cognition uh, means what is prior with respect to the other one. Uh, so sensible, uh, sensible faculty or, or sensible knowledge is what um, allows for something to be given to fault. Uh, so it, uh, so it's it's lower cognition because it it's coming first. So it's the condition for logical knowledge, and and in Heidegger it is kind of the same in the sense that for him. Uh, the truth uh, that we uh, unveil by poiesis, which is the truth of unveiling, is the activity uh, by which something is given to be thought. Uh, so it's the emergence of something out of nothing, at least because there is this letting something to be determined that then scientific knowledge is possible. So it's higher faculty, but it's also coming after. So it is because something is given to be thought that we can have logic knowledge. And the same is in, um, in Baumgarten where uh, the lower faculty is what uh, is confronted with this chaos of the sensible uh, to extract something from the chaos of the sensible. And it is this activity, sensible activity or uh, sensible knowledge that provides the given to be thought of. Um, and, uh, and the Leibniz is, 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 is like this. So we have two, two levels. We have the level of sensible obscure perception, but it's because there is this work of it on, on sensible perception, some obscure perception that we can form 
the objects that then are known scientifically but later and uh, and i think that the relation between um Baumgarten, so Leibniz Baumgarten, because because Baumgarten basically transforms a little bit um, uh, Leibniz um, conception of of knowledge. So it makes this distinction between the two, two faculties. Um, we we have to to introduce Nietzsche, which is really important. And so uh, Nietzsche is 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 a thinker of sensible knowledge, and is a thinker of sensible knowledge because he considers that. Um, logic uh, determination of, of reality or logical construction of reality. Uh, it's a way of uh, transforming the sensible chaos into identical cases, into beings which are equivalent. So logic is based, based on classes of equivalent things. So it's a thinking of a journey. But to do this, we have to um, extract or to uh, purify beings from all the qualities, which are the sensible qualities. So there is a primal way of knowing, which is the sensible confrontation with the chaos, uh, which is a sensible and aesthetic way of, uh, of knowing, which is to produce an appearance of being from this, this chaos. And it is because we do this, that then we can apply logic to the beings that we, that we created. Uh, so I think it's a lower, faculty of knowing, but it's lower uh, because it comes first, it's more primal. So it's it's a confrontation with a truth, but it's another way of truth, the truth um, that regards uh, how the given is given to fault, uh, while logic is about what is given. Um, so I, I don't see, I mean, I'm, there is a transformation of a theory uh, during during history, but I think that the, um, the gesture is kind of kind of the same. Of course, Heidegger is coming later, so he has other references. Um, but, but I think that yes, the lower cognition is just what come, comes first. So for for Heidegger, uh, this this metaphysical thinking is really what can ground logic. Or scientific knowledge. Right. Thank you. Very, thank you very much. Um, I, 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 I do think that there is some uh, um, uh, not really similarity, you know, resonance between um, that which surprises, that which cannot be grasped by 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 logical knowledge. But for example, like we, we find in Baumgarten. And if the question of being, which cannot be reduced to logical operations or, 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 or uh, to ontic form of knowing in Heidegger. Um, so I re I'm willing to consider, as I did in my, in my own work as well, to consider that, um, that what was addressed you know, by Leibniz and also by Baumgarten and what Heidegger called being, belong to the same category. I belong to the same, same category, it doesn't mean that they are the same, but rather they are that which could not, could not be reduced to uh, predictions or to logical operations. So I think, I think we, we, we agree on this point. Uh, and only I think in that the question of being uh, is no, for Heidegger, it's a probably no pre-logical uh, in the sense that it is not only, it is a sensible, but, bef but, but before logical. Uh, it is known uh, with no ontic or no ontological, but it doesn't mean that it is, uh, it is to be found in the sensible. Or maybe you can even say that the question of being has a superior, uh, has a superior place uh, and could not be simply put in that category, in, in those categories of, uh, for example, sensible or, or, or logical. But that would be my, 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 my way to reconcile what you said and, and what Heidegger might, uh, might say. 
Um, now, this, this, the, the second question that I have uh, is, um, um, well, of course, you know, with, with Nietzsche, that um, um, especially his, his reference to Schopenhauer and to Kant uh, um, uh, on the question of, 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 the, of the thing in itself, or even on the, on the unknown, unknown uh, resonates with what we are talking about uh, here. Um, the second question that I would like to ask is that to discuss with you is that uh, you 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 brought something quite interesting to the discourse on AI, and I think this may, but if we want to push it further, we may also want to ask if we can even transform our understanding of AI via what you call prophecy. Because now AI has nothing to do with prophecy, uh, AI has to do with prediction. Uh, but the way that you try to uh, take it further is to think how could this, how could aesthetics help us to understand or even to integrate a kind of a prophecy in the development of AI? Um, if this is the case, then uh, the technology that we are talking about is no longer what Heidegger called modern technique. Because if it is able to address this question of prophecy, then it is no longer modern technique. Then it, it will produce a third uh, category of techniques. I mean, the first two being techne, the Greek techne, Poriasis, and modern technology or modern technique, which is Gestell. And then we are going to maybe say there is another one that might come if we are able to think uh, through the question of prophecy here. Um, so I, I wanted to ask you if you can elaborate on this. And if you can, uh, of course, as you said, there is no guarantee. <laughs> there is no guarantee because it is uh, um, because the unknowable remains always unknowable. Um, so we cannot uh, we cannot deal with it as um, a technical question to be resolved. Uh, but I wonder if you could, you know, uh, elaborate more on these points and. Uh, speculates on on such possibility yeah so i think that one one of the of the biggest problem in artificial intelligence is that i think that the most basic way of thinking is actually um rational decision making <laughs> which which is not so we are taking us for, for the ground of intelligence, the way in which uh, an organism can adapt to, to, to the environment. Um, and, then, and, and, then, and then the logic uh, capacity of um, organizing activity uh, in an efficient way. So I think this is the primal way of what is thinking. Um, but I think it's the reversal. So I, I think that the, the sensible knowledge is Primal, so I think that okay, we start with an organism that can do behave efficiently in in the environment. So artificial intelligence, which is based on on a model of intelligence, has been able to adapt to, to the environment, to, to reproduce successfully. So to, uh, to to have to, to arrive extract all the resources which is needed in order to grow as, as a species, and then we think okay, then. Uh, the other things like uh, capacity of producing artworks will emerge spontaneously, you know, <laughs> like it was the, the highest uh, faculty. But I think we, we should we should reverse uh, reverse the order and uh, and let the rational faculty to emerge from a simulation of a sensible faculty, um, which does not exist today in, in artificial intelligence. So there is, there is a, a way of 
um, simulating sensible knowledge, which is not sensible knowledge, because it's it's a way of addressing logically um, artworks or images or what is supposed to be the object of aesthetic knowledge. Uh, so aesthetic knowledge is not possible. So the knowledge of a singular is not possible for artificial intelligence. Uh, so this is this is the problem in, for example, in, um, in in recognizing the authenticity of artworks which are produced by artificial intelligence. They are just patterns of information. There is no way to to make the difference between an original image and a not original image. Um, so they are equivalent. So we have to add a code to testify this is the original, but we have to add a code to, to say this is original because it cannot be distinguished from, from the standpoint of the quantity of information is the same. Uh, so there is no this capacity of knowing the singular or knowing the sensible. And I think that uh, for our intelligence, the knowledge of a singular comes first. So in all our meaningful life, uh, we know uh, a person because it's a singular person. So when we love someone, we love that person because it's that person, unique person, and we recognize for all the traits, for all the qualities that exceed the way in which it belongs to a category of rational chosen maker, for example. Uh, and this is uh, a knowledge which comes first and, and that is not reducible, cannot be reduced to, to, to the other. So I think that today in artificial intelligence, they are kind of saying, okay, we start with a general then the capacity of knowing the singular will emerge because we uh, create hypotheses more and more precise about um, the, um, the users. So for example, uh, algorithms are able to predict the decisions of users and they are able to, um, identify users with smaller and smaller categories, but it's still a category, it's still a logic category. It's not the knowledge of uh, a unique person in the same way as we know somebody when we love this person, which is a way of considering that it exceeds all the category, you know? And this is something which comes first. So I think that to elaborate um, a sort of new artificial intelligence, it should be artificial intelligence, which is, which starts knowing from the singular by analogy, uh, rather than starting to know from the general. Um, it, it would be completely different. So it probably will not make efficient decisions. Like we do not when we are, when we are, reasoning outside uh, the pursuit of our own interest. Um, so yeah, this is, but this is my kind of speculation. Good. I don't know if it's possible. You know. oh, thank you very much. And I think that the question of think, starting with the singular mm -hmm. um, uh, is quite interesting observation. But, but at the same time, I feel that you may not really uh, um, it may not really refer to, um, maybe it, it's not perfectly consistent with what we have discussed, because I think that um, the, the, especially when it refers to, to the case about love, uh, love for the singular person. But here, I think what love is always, um, what, what, what is in love is, is, the, is that the object of desire uh, doesn't really exist as yeah. such. No, so, what I mean is that, for, for example, artificial intelligence knows somebody after having considered the most possible cases. So he has to know uh, one million profiles in order to know one profile. While we, when, when we start, when we are babies, for example, we, we love the mother uh, without knowing any other case. <laughs> you, you see what I mean? Right, right. right. But, but I, I, what, what I'm trying to say is that it's not only maybe not only about the uniqueness, but also this object of uh, you know the love, the object of love or the object of desire does not exist neither as a singular person nor a general person. It's precisely because it's the object of desire 
So it doesn't exist <laughs> as such. And this is a, could be, we can maybe, we could call this a, something non-rational, that the non-rationality and the non-rational is at bottom, is, 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 uh, um, is at bottom of this economy. So when Heidegger tried to make a distinction between, for example, rational, irrational, and non-rational, uh, maybe we could call it, we could, we could put being and the non-rational in the same category and to think how to such non-rational, uh, how, how, how the non-rational could manifest in the, uh, uh, in the intelligence, um, but that would be a really speculative question. As you said, there's no guarantee, but it would be a really speculative question to, to think through. So I think we have quite some questions from the uh, audience. Maybe we can look uh, at them. Uh, so I'm trying to, well, I'm, I, maybe I, we can, uh, they're not, uh, there are a few of them. So maybe I can try to read uh, them out and then see if you want to answer. So the first question from Joe White. Uh, thank you, Anna, wonderful presentation. Uh, Anna, if you, you can refer to the Q&A, a bottom, you know, yeah. uh, and you can see it. Uh, yeah. A wonderful presentation. I wonder what you might think of the feeling of the sublime, but not the beautiful, in so far as the sublime precisely assists the mathematical and the understanding. It does violence, perhaps Dionysian, Dionysic to our capacity to stigmatize. Yes, I, I cannot find the question on the Q&A. You find the question on the Q&A. Uh, yes, because I, I had the other one. Uh, okay. If you look at the chat, it's not on the chat. Mm -hmm. on the Q &A. Yes, I, I found it. Um, well, yeah, so, um, so thanks for, for the question. Uh, so I, I don't, um, I, I don't think that we can we can reduce the Baumgartian categories to to Kantian categories. So can't can't make a distinction between uh, beautiful and and sublime because it considers aesthetic as a subjective um, feeling, uh, which does not produce any knowledge. According to Baumgarten, uh, what is beautiful is is true objectively. <laughs> so, um, so for Baumgarten is, 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 a, is a theory of knowledge. Uh, so what is beautiful is aesthetically true. To be aesthetically true means that the construction is efficient to bring about, to convey uh, uh, aesthetic truth. An aesthetic truth is the truth of a singular entity, so a very determined concept of a singular being which is in the mind of God. Um, so to be beautiful does not mean that it provoke a feeling in, in the subject. Uh, it means that the, the subject recognizing the description uh, because it, it's about uh, writing or, or poetry, recognizing in the description a truth. So it's the way in which we describe there is a novel. In the novel, there is a character. And by reading, we have the impression that this character is true. It is really the expression of a, a metaphysical truth, the truth of a singular uh, possible real being. And because it could be real, it could exist. It's an expression of a truth, a metaphysical truth that is beautiful. But it's not beautiful because we are affected uh, by the image. Um, so there is no distinction between the beautiful and the sublime because it's 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 another way of conceiving uh, of conceiving um, aesthetics. Um, so of course there is this feeling of sublime if we want to translate this in Baumgartian terms. Because basically the, the aesthetician is confronted with this, this chaos of, of the sensible, with this chaos of obscure perceptions. So it's kind of 
overwhelmed because all this infinity of obscure perception that characterize a being as singular is really overwhelming the power of the concept. Um, so there is something, so Kant read Baumgarten in some way, but he translated Baumgarten in its own uh, system. And uh, in particular, it does not consider that aesthetics produce any truth. And for me, what is important in Baumgarten is that we can address aesthetics as a way of knowing that produces uh, the knowledge of some truth with a specific technique for conveying, um, for conveying truth. Right, so I hope I hope uh, Joe is happy with the uh, uh, the answer. So we have a second question uh, from Karl Kratz. I have a pop question about the difference between uh, philosophy, uh, between art and philosophy. In the first part of the talk, you emphasized Dasein's reflexivity, a uh, reflectivity. But towards the end, it seems like philosophy is not so much about reflecting and thinking but more about poiesis, creating something out of nothing, prophecy, true lie, is philosophy equal to art? And for Heidegger, isn't thinking something other than creating art? Could you elaborate on the difference between art and philosophy? Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, sure, thanks for, for the question. So um, yeah, I, I completed a little bit uh, philosophy and art uh, because I didn't have it time really to, 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 to explain. Uh, anyway, uh, for, for Heidegger, there is a similarity between, between the philosopher and, uh, and the poet, um, which uh, emerges in, uh, um, in the, uh, what is metaphysics. So at, at, at the end, after or the criticism, of, for example, Carnap's criticism, etc., he added notes, and in these notes, he makes very clear uh, that for him uh, there is an analogy between the work of the poet and the work of um, of a philosopher, uh, meaning that uh, they are both grounded on this inquiry on the essence of being. Then, of course, the kind of products are different, but um, for Heidegger, what is interesting is that the poetic use of language is kind of similar to the use of language of the metaphysicians. Uh, so after writing, um, after this conference, which is called What is Metaphysics, uh, Heidegger was accused by Carnap to produce meaningless talking. So Carnap wrote this paper, which was called um, the um, elimination of metaphysics uh, through the metaphysics. analysis of language. And he, he took uh, Heidegger as an example of meaningless uh, speech, of meaningless talking, uh, something that cannot be uh, logically uh, accepted. Uh, so for Heidegger, this way of using the language, which is the way in which the metaphysician has to use the language, is very similar to the way in which the poet uses the language, because they are trying to convey not logical truth, but another kind, uh, kind of truth. Uh, so this is, this is the link uh, for, uh, for, for Heidegger. Um, and um, uh, yeah. Then in, in, in Baumgarten, uh, we also find, I think, something which is really interesting. So he says that uh, for the artist, it's a way of uh, knowing um, very determined uh, aesthetic truth. So very determined metaphysical truth. So the truth of the most, the smallest detail. And for the um, philosopher, on the contrary, is to uh, perceive aesthetically general concepts. So when we say, for example, mathematic, mathematical theorem are beautiful, for the philosopher is to perceive aesthetically general concepts. Um, so metaphysic or, or philosophy, it's a way of aesthetically uh, perceiving the unicity of the production of thoughts. Uh, so the, to, to understand, to, to value the value of uh, scientific theory, for example, um, and to value it forever. Um, so we know that for, for science, uh, theories of the past are of no more value, they're just fake, 
by, by a false theory because they are past theories and they don't have any value. But philosophically, we can appreciate um, the singular creation of a spirit forever. So there is a way of aesthetically perceiving general truth, uh, which makes um, the specificity of um, aesthetic philosophical perfection perception with respect to the artistic uh, aesthetic perception. Right. But I just give one, you know, a background information to that is that, uh, especially on the text that uh, Anna is referring to. I mean, the, the question for Heidegger was asking um, uh, that because the, 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 the article, um, the question concerning technology, uh, basically start with the question, what is the essence of technology? Um, um, and it is poiesis. And towards the end of the article that when Heidegger tried to refer to Goethe and so on in order to show that the, what it means by essence means to preserve. So the essence is something that preserves itself. That is to say the poiesis preserves itself. Um, but then if the modern technology is no longer about uh, Poiesis, but Gestelle, then maybe in art we still find this possibility or this relation to the question of being. So that's why he asked, uh, where I send you the quote, when he refers to that maybe in the realm of art, this is the possibility. And I think this is why Anna referred to, to, to art and uh, thinking in, 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 in um, in the sense, not, not that they are identity, not that they're identical, but here they refer to the question of being uh, in, 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 in Heidegger. Yes. So the next uh, question from Jean um, Sikers. Uh, so thank you for the rich presentation. My question concerns one possible relation between science and Heidegger of phenomenology. Namely, can there ever be an interpretation of experimental data in the cognitive sciences that, that ex escapes the crushes of the Gustav? Can we use a language that captures experience that also correlates with brain function? Or does the mere fact that knowledge of brain function derives from the logic, the experimental method pre Precluded any productive integration between poiesis and the cognitive science, contrary to what some uh, 4E uh, cognitive scientists might argue. Um, I, I think that um, that can be, but if somebody does this, what is producing is an hypothesis that the scientific community won't recognize as a true hypothesis. So one, one, one can say to whatever, starting from the same data, uh, any hypothesis is basically possible. The, the goal is to find the hypothesis that ought to be believed as true because it, it's efficient. Um, if I make hypotheses by chance that are not efficient, so I'm the only one who believe them. So to, to produce the objectivity means to produce the convergence of belief of, of the community. Uh, so the interpretation of data usually is meant to produce the subjectivity of this uh, convergence of, of beliefs, it's in this way that objectivity is, is, is produced. Um, so of course we, we can do anything, but it doesn't. So we can analyze data in any way, but not any way of analyzing data is a scientific hypothesis. You, you know, actually there is, um, uh, this is a very interesting question because I think there was two, I, I maybe I can, I can say there, were, there have been two attempts. Uh, that may respond to your question. The first one is the Heideggerian AI. 
you know, there was a proposed big, like, for example, uh, many years ago by people like Hubert Jeifers, you know, who, who died a couple of years ago. You know, when, when he's trying to understand, you know, uh, a certain, you know, being in time in the first, in, in division one of being in time, when Heidegger describes, uh, for example, the relation between uh, Dasein and the environment. So, so he referred that to, he connected that to kind of a, uh, the neurodynamics, that to, uh, to connect, uh, um, to connectionism, um, and that kind of uh, that become the base of later called Heideggerian AI, uh, or a solution to uh, to to the Heideggerian AI. But the second the second attempt uh, maybe is is a way to map the uh, spiritual experience to use EEG to uh, capture the uh, spiritual experience and see under what uh, circumstance we can stimulate the brain to produce a spiritual experience, you know, in the, in the sense of prophecy, for example. Uh, and this has been, uh, there are some projects like this are going on, for example, um, in the, um, the neuroscientist Wolf Singer, who, who used to be the uh, director of the Max Planck Institute for Neuroscience in, in Munich and also a, a French Tibetan monk. I think they were together for that question. Uh, but I don't know if they, re they are really, uh, but all these effort really corresponds to what Anna was saying. Um, I, I don't think- I think so. what, what is interesting is for example, they, they, they're trying, like they're trying to uh, understand scientifically the experience of meditation, which is really similar if, if we want to this, we draw in, in nothing in Heidegger. So in meditation, there is a sort of um, not thinking. Uh, so, and yeah. as they are trying to understand scientifically what happens in the brain in the state of meditation, which exactly. is a sort so, of... So, so that's why when, when, because once I have this discussion with Paul Zinga and uh, his proposal is basically that the cathedral is in the brain. The cathedral is in the brain, you know, the cathedral uh, doesn't exist uh, yeah. outside the brain. The cathedral is inside the brain. Um, but it would be really interesting to confront this question, uh, these kind of questions, uh, you know, also with a uh, neuroscientist, um, because I think it's our focus. Uh, it's a really problematic. So we have another question with Mariana uh, Vashton. I was wondering about Heidegger's significance in relation to the current posthumanist turn to the comments in which way his philosophical approach informs the current technological concerns and the concept of the Anthropocene. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's kind of too, too general as, as a question. Um, so of course we, we can read we can read Heidegger's concern in in ecological sense, meaning that okay, there is a consumption, extreme consumption of of everything. So beings are just considered as resources to be to be to be consumed. So it's a, in a certain ways a transformation of of, of the planet it, itself into it was standing reserve. So it can be seen as the Anthropocene. Um, so we, we can make some relation, but I, I, I really, it's, it's a kind of too general as a question to, to answer properly. Right. Um, so we have another question for, from uh, Fischilio Rivas. Uh, gratitude for the wonderful talk. My question is, would you rather categorize science making with a theoretical or experimental as more in tune with Nietzsche's view of the power of the force capable of reading knowledge of its ascetic ideal. My thinking here is if we are talking about science, it must be a science devoid of the uh, ascetic impulse that Nietzsche attributes to the pursuit of logical identity, mathematical equality, and the physical equilibrium, 
Despite this Nietzschean background, Heidegger, does not, Heidegger didn't absorb this crucial concept of science. He's still of the opinion that science is this form of knowledge that Nietzsche sought to exorcise from uh, ascetism. This goes to say, at least for Nietzsche, there's still the possibility of science to protect itself from what Heidegger calls Gestern. I, I don't know if I agree with this. Uh, mean, mean, meaning that I, I thought that Nietzsche was against uh, asceticism. Uh, so, so in the will to power, for example, it's not at all a way of achieving uh, asceticism. Um, so, uh, but then Nietzsche changed a lot from, from the beginning to, to the end. Um, so um, Heidegger was basically inspired by the will to power, which is the last work by Nietzsche, which was published posthumous and was just a collection of notes basically. And it's kind of, um, maybe different from, from other works. So, so Heidegger, is, well, Heidegger is the first person who really treated Nietzsche as a real philosopher because before Heidegger, Nietzsche was not considered as a philosopher. He was kind of essayist or something else. Uh, but it was, it was Heidegger who uh, elevated him to the dignity of, of a real philosopher by commenting the will to power in his book um, on, on Nietzsche, which is a book on the will to power. In, in, in the will to power, basically uh, science is, is, is condemned. Uh, it's condemned. It's like uh, revealed to be the appearance, an appearance of truth rather than absolute uh, truth. And, and the goal is not to, 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 to achieve uh, a strategism of peace, of, of equilibrium at all, but the goal is to be creative. So the goal for the philosopher is to be creative like an artist. And the artist is the person who creates lies. Um, so that, that's my interpretation at least of, of Nietzsche. I also don't, don't think that, I, don't, I also don't think that it is the position of Nietzsche, you know, when the, it, because in the Heidegger's writing, on Nietzsche, I mean, Heidegger sees the, uh, the, the will to power as the opus, as the most important part of Nietzsche. But there was a reference also to uh, the preface, there was uh, to the uh, birth of tragedy that late, that uh, Nietzsche added uh, later, where Heidegger also emphasized on, on, on one sentence when, when Nietzsche says he wanted to. Um, Nietzsche says that you want to see science under the optics of uh, art, and you want to see uh, art under the optics of life. Uh, so uh, I don't think I don't know I don't I am not sure if it could be really be something like what you said to protect from the Gestell. Um The other question from Katia Yudis Wunz. Anna, thanks for the thought-provoking presentation. My question is, isn't experiencing an AI-produced art automatically a transcendental experience? Since we know there's nothing behind the art, no subject that is not knowable, but a synthesis or a summary of subjects produced alteration or images, and therefore, wouldn't it be prophetic? Thank you so much. Uh, I think it's predictive and not prophetic. I think it's predictive uh, because um, artworks are generated like the elements of a series uh, in the same way as, um, as an algorithm can produce images of cats once you learn what is the information pattern of, of a cat. So just a way of learning the information part of an artwork and then produce the whole series, which, which is possible, even though this elements does not exist in reality, but it doesn't mean that uh, it's a prophecy, just a prediction. Um, predict 
something for an algorithm means um, to make an hypothesis about the, the rule but produce a series of occurrences or, or elements. Uh, and this is predictive. Even though the elements of a series that can be generated by this rule are not elements that we, uh, we knew, we experienced, or we could have predicted, but doesn't mean that they are not predictable. It's like we have a series of numbers, like Fibonacci series of number. If there is a rule to produce all the series of number, but the algorithm produce a number that we didn't uh, calculate doesn't mean that it's prophetic, it's not predictable. It's just that we couldn't calculate all the series. So the same thing with uh, art produced by algorithm. It's just a way, automatic way of producing a series, um, I think. Uh, right, so um, thank you very much. Uh, I don't see there is many, uh, there's other questions. I think there's a one percent a comment from uh, Vigilio saying that to read science of this aesthetic impulse is the project of Nietzsche's gay science. Anyway, thanks for the response, wonderful talk. So uh, I don't see uh, there's, uh, yeah, thank you for the for this reference to, to gay science. Uh, that would be also interesting to this for discussion uh, in another occasion. So uh, I don't see there's any question. I don't know if, uh, if uh, the audience have further questions. So, um, but if no, so um, maybe we can also conclude here. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Anna, for the, for the talk and also for uh, the, the, the answers uh, to the questions from the audience. So uh, to you, thank you Anna. very much. Yeah, it was great, thank you. Thank you, and I also would like to, uh, to, to thank uh, Ashley and Erin for making, uh, for organizing this event. And, and also I wanted to say that uh, next month in February, we have another event, another dialogue with uh, Henning Schmiggen, um, um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, epistemologist, uh, experts on epistemology. So, um, um, so you, you can you can find more information from our uh, you can find information from our our, our website as well. So uh, thank you very much, everyone. So I hope to uh, see see some of you uh, again next uh, month. Thank you. Have a nice day. Nice evening. <laughs>